Hey, everybody. Welcome to A Voice in the Hollow. I'm your host, Miguel Ortega, and birthday girl on the right <laughs> is Tran Ma. Yes, that is me. So she uh, she realized today that I've been strategically placing the balloons uh, behind her throughout the week. So that <laughs> it would be all in the background. A, yeah, I didn't really want that on the stream, but yeah. oh well. Yeah, there's a, there's a giant unicorn as well right above her. So uh, yeah, so uh, so welcome everybody. Um, yeah, let's get started. Tran is going to kick off today, and then I'll jump in and show you guys some cool stuff. Okay, so I don't have um, super exciting stuff. Basically, what I've been doing is just filing, finaling the set, trying to get this to look, um, you know, as best as I can, and then um, I started moving on to another set, which is the one that Miguel has been doing previous on. So uh, that's what I have. And I'm not going to show uh, what I've been doing with the new thing because I don't think there's anything to show. Um, I'll probably show it next week. Uh, as far as what I did here, um, they don't look like dramatic big changes if I show you my screen. Um, but basically, I made these pieces here, right? Uh, I felt like they were necessary. Um, it took, you know... It takes time, any single time that we have to build something that's custom. Uh, we always go, you know, do we need it? Because, again, we don't have a ton of time to do custom stuff. Um, but you can see what it looks like without it, right? So, actually, let's make this full screen. It's just so it's a little bit larger. So what it, this is what it looks like without them. Um, to me, they bring this other level of busyness. Um, they're not big, uh, but I really super wanted them um and there's not many types of sets that you can build out there that has where we're being really busy actually works whereas for here it really works to add to this busyness altars altars yeah. look busy yes altars look busy um and then these pieces i just thought were, were pretty cool they're not difficult to build um but they're basically um they're based on i i don't know i'm probably gonna pronounce this incorrectly but they're fawn Asen, so they're not from the Edo, um, African Edos, but they're basically altar pieces and used to, from what my understanding is, you know, I haven't studied the history, so I could be saying everything incorrectly, uh, but from what my understanding is, they're meant to help worship the ancestors, right? Um, so they are actually um, some sort of religious piece uh, for the Fawn culture. So I went in and I placed them around so you can see, um, I think they, you know, add more complexity again before and after. Um, and again here, right? And then even here, right? So they give more complexity. I worry that this looks too empty back here. So um, it looks okay without it. But again, I like having a smaller level of detail. Um, I feel design-wise, without it, you just have something uh, very large. Um, we have large secondary, and then the altar kind of gives it the tertiary extra detail that I would like to have. Um, so basically here, they're not meant to stand out, right? That's not their job. You can see them back here. Uh, but without it, I always felt the back here felt really empty. Um, and for me, design-wise, when I was working on this, I didn't really want to obstruct this, this too much, right? Because we still want to see it. Um, so again, I felt it was empty. And then the altars just kind of take care of that. It just gives it a little bit more visual complexity. Uh, let's see another shot. And then we have a new one here um, that Miguel framed. So you can see they just add just around here, extra highlights. Uh, and then we also have a chandelier up here now. So that's what I was uh, doing. Which is made out of the same piece. Yeah, so it's basically the same piece. I just flipped it upside down and squashed it. So it just happens to look very much like a chandelier. <laughs> uh, so it works. Uh, another piece that I finaled was one I was showing last week, which is this drum here, right, um, in this one. And let me just load that level very quickly just to kind of show you what it looks like. Okay, so this is my 
level where I just put stuff in to see how things look like. Um, and then up close, you can see there's much more detail. All the rope has all this um, stuff. And then I, I have my drum here, which was the drum from Omega Scans, right? So the rope was custom made. Um, this is from Mega Scans, but it's been cleaned up. Um, it was Japanese, right? So I removed all that stuff. Um, and these are just pieces that I modified. Basically, this was like kind of like a bridge, and I just curved it. Um, I mean, literally, just a drum uh, shell was Mega Scan. Yeah, not yeah. just these yeah. are different Mega Scan pieces, and I bashed together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this one's been modified yeah. just so it doesn't look like a 100% uh, Japanese drum. Right, just to feel a little bit more correct to our aesthetic. The other thing I worked on, which doesn't seem very big, but it's important for our story. And again, it does take time, is I made these spheres here. Yeah, it may be one of the most important. Yes. Props. So anything that's important um, has needs a little bit more time. I can't rush through it. Uh, again, we're but again, we're always low on time. And as far as the uniqueness of it, um, I try to make it simple because you don't see spheres all the time, like throughout the whole story, but you know, basically just two spheres. So uh, the snake one belongs to Koa and this kind of wolf one um, right here belongs to Ala, right? And then the rest of it is the same. So it's just basically swapping this out. Um, and then the other thing I had to do was make um, a broken version, right? Which doesn't seem difficult, but actually, doing broken wood shards takes a long time. It's easy to do it bad. Yeah, it's very easy to do it bad. Uh, when it's done right, you're like, yeah, that's how it looks. But when it's done wrong, you're like, that looks terrible, right? So I'll show you how I did this. Um, I basically merged scan data with a custom piece. I think it's a cool technique. So I want to go over how I did these things. Um, let's make it out of, not trying to do screenshot. Uh, let's get out of here. Um, and then I just want to show a few things. Uh, actually, before I jump to the drum, there's a couple of things that I've been doing that I think is kind of interesting. They don't really seem that special, um, but they really help me when I'm working, right? So uh, before I get into the specifics, some assets, I'll just show you a, a couple of tricks. So um, in our scene, like especially for the ceremony or just certain objects, right? Uh, you have a lot of repetition. So we have a lot of squarish type of platforms. Um, and we don't really want it to look perfectly square. It doesn't fit the aesthetic. You kind of want to break up the shape a little bit so that it's just not very mechanical looking, right? So let's turn on the wireframe. And um, I didn't do it on this cube, for example, but this is what I've been doing. Um, let me just divide this a little bit more. And let me just scale this up. Okay, scale it up again. All right. And let me just scale this here. So I have a lot of like type of beam structures or, or things um, that I want to look more unique and again, be more broken up. And it's not difficult to do. It can just end up taking a lot of time eventually, right? So normally the way um, this might be approached is you come in here, you bring in ZBrush or you do it in Maya and then you manually um, move things around uh, yourself. Uh, again, that becomes time consuming. So I kind of came up with this trick. Let's make this point much 3D. Let's turn this off. Um, let's say I have like a bunch of beams. And again, they all look the same. So I did this a lot on mega scan pieces, right? And after a while, even though the scans look fantastic, they do look repetitive. Uh, and the way I tried to get around it is I would apply some surface noise. So I would go into noise here. Let's just load up the pen because I think that always helps a little bit. Okay. Um, and then what I would do, uh, as far as how this works, it's pretty simple, right? I can just use this menu. I can increase the strength of my noise. And then what I can do here is I can adjust the scale, for example, right? Um, 
there's actually two layers of noise you can add, right? So you can use just wh whatever this default one is, which is just looks like this. Uh, and then you can use a noise plugin. So click on that. And then what I use is Perlin because it's really soft and that's what I'm looking for. Uh, now I'll have two noises going on. Um, the default one, uh, black doesn't help. Default one is basic mix noise here, right? And it's controlled up here. Um, so I basically just set this to zero. So it has no effect, right? And then now I'm just gonna adjust my plugin scale and the strength here. So let's just increase the strength. So to see what I have. Okay, so I have this noise, this Perlin one. Um, it's really fine. And what I actually do is I just make it pretty large, say something like this. Right now, I don't really want to um, make it noisy like this, but I'll bring it up pretty high and I'll just say, OK, so we'll get something like this. Uh, let's lower the strength because this is going to blow up. OK, so maybe at this level and I'll say, OK, now it doesn't do anything until I apply it. So I just have to hit apply mesh again. This is under surface noise. And what that does is it just breaks my silhouette. So this is just a little trick that I've been doing <laughs> with all my stuff because, the, again, they all look really repetitive, right? Um, so just by doing that, especially in a dark scene, um, it just gives me just some complexity. And that saves me a ton of time. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the downside to it is that this doesn't really work well on very thin objects. So the ultra piece was super thin, and it didn't take to it very well. Uh, but I have been using this for a lot. Now let's just jump over to my drum. Okay, so this is what the final asset looks like. Um, and then I want to show how it was built. So basically, I only had to construct this much. And if you look at it technically, it's not very hard to do, right? Um, when we look at it all together, it looks more impressive. Uh, but you can see I don't have any of the rope texture on this, okay? Um, and I basically just did this one section and replicated it over and over, right? And then I do have seams. So none of these are one whole piece, okay? So um, I basically broke it up where I think you can't see it. So you can see there is kind of a strategic break. Now, what I also did um, here was I thought, how am I going to texture this? Um, what's the easiest way? So normally for something like this, um, the way the UVs would be laid out is not like this. So you can see my UV window. Um, and I am breaking out of my UDIM. So I'm crossing all my borders, uh, which means I can't take this into substance and texture it. Now, uh, I made a decision not to do that because I would actually lose a lot of resolution, right? So if I show you this rope texture that I have, just so you can get a little bit of perspective, on this, um, it looked like this. So this is a mega scan texture. So I know, okay, I have this, so I can basically work on as a tube, and I can apply this texture on top. Now the problem with this texture is it's very difficult to work with um, something that has, does not have a square aspect ratio. Most textures are supposed to be square. Uh, so what I then did is I just took it to Photoshop and just tiled it like this. So now that I have something like that, um, and it's gonna make my life a lot easier. Now, if I wanna actually customize this texture, again, this gets technical, but you know, if you're here to learn and you wanna be a modeler, you have to know all this stuff, right? Um, basically, what I would have to do is just scale these all down like this and lay this out. Um, the issue I have with this is that the textures uh, will be much lower resolution, right? So everything would be, feel smaller. You can see how much I lose. And the detail level is very fine, meaning if we look back here um, again, there's a lot of small details, right? So if we get up close, um, far away, we can see kind of the rope. And then we're up close, we can see the fine fibers. Um, I know for a fact all of these fine fibers will disappear if I try to texture this the traditional way. Um, it might be done correctly, but all those details would be gone. And I also know that this shot 
is a close-up shot and I want to catch all the fibers I can get. Um, so what I did instead was I decided, hey, let's just lay this out like this. Now, the other thing, um, as I noticed in the comments, that some people commenting that UVs seem like a nightmare. So, uh, and I was like thinking, no, it's not, it's super easy. Uh, but that's if you, you actually know how to do it. So I just wanna give a quick demonstration to actually how to UV fast. Um, so I work with upper term students and beginner students. And I realized like, if you're not taught how to UV, it just is a nightmare. <laughs> so um, I'll give a quick, quick demonstration for this. Uh, so you can see here, I have a very clean UV. It's super straight, um, which is what we want. Uh, if you know, if I, I have this toolkit open here too. So also if you go to UV editor, you go tools, you can open this kit. Um, and this kit, if you know this well, it's actually super easy. So what would I do if I didn't have UVs? So let's just blow this away here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this. Since I have no UVs, there's nothing to actually unwrap, right? So let's just select this here, go to UV, and I'm just going to give it a plane of projection. Um, you can see it just projects it as a plane. Uh, so we have this here, which is fine. We're going to unfold this and unwrap it. Uh, but now I have something actually to unfold and cut up. And the direction, the angle of the plane or projection doesn't really matter that much. Like you want no. it, it's, it's ideal if it's along like the length of it, but it really doesn't matter. Not so much, yeah. yeah. Um, now I'm just gonna select an edge. The other thing is if you're a very dirty modeler, then uh, you will have a hard time UVing. So model is clean, it's very even. Uh, I can just double click on an edge and I can go up here and I can just cut. Now once I cut this, I'm gonna right click, go to UV shell, and I'm just going to go under, let's collapse on this menu. So it's an intimidating menu, but it basically has all your tools here. Uh, I just go under unfold, which you probably can't see it because it's tiny font. And I just press the unfold button. Right now I just have something like that. Now it's almost already straight. Okay. Now, um, actually, I don't even rotate this because rotating takes a long time. So what I do instead is I use, let's erase this. Uh, go under Arrange and Layout, and there's an Orient Shells tool, right? So I basically press Unfold. I basically try to press buttons and do as little manual work as I can. And I'm just going to press Orient, and it just rotates it for me. Now, it's not a big deal if you're talking about one tube, but if you have like 100 tubes, it's a big deal because you don't want to manually do all that stuff, right? All right. So once I have this, um, I can do a couple things. Uh, I would like to straighten this out. So what I'm going to do here is go under Unfold, and then you have straighten U, UVs, right? And then you have U and V. So U is basically horizontal lines. Uh, v is vertical, right? So the way, if you're trying to learn this, just remember V is for vertical, and then U has to be the other direction, which is horizontal. Um, I'm going to do one at a time. I never do both at the same time because it can kind of wig out. And this, that's that's not what V stands for. Just just to clarify. It's yeah, it just, doesn't stand for it's that. It's just a cheat. Yeah. It's just like a, a time. it's just a way to remember something. Yeah. So I'm going to select the shell. I'm going to hit straighten UVs. It's going to take a moment to process, which feels like an eternity while you're streaming and you have people looking at you. And I hope it doesn't crash. Why I'm doing, but it doesn't crash when I'm actually doing it. Okay, so now you can see all my vertical lines are straight, right? And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to delete history. So you build history, it starts to really slow down, which makes it when you're trying to unfold, um, it just takes longer. So I just delete history. Now I'm going to do you, and just straighten this here. Okay, and now you can see it's straight. Um, we have a built-in texture checker pattern that we can turn on with this button right here, right? And now I can look at it and go, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, there's some issues down here. We can just correct that. So it looks like it just was too straight here. Uh, so I can just pull this down, just go to U, or sorry, UVs. And I probably have, oh, it's right here. 
So I can just snap this up, snap this down around here. And now it's a little squish, so I can just grab this and pull it up. Okay. But other than that, it's, it's actually pretty good. Now what I did is I lined them up over here. Um, there's a few ways to do it. The way I do it is I just go to shell mode. So right click UV shell. Right now it's in shell mode. Everything I select will be the whole shell. And then if you go up here to transform, uh, you have this pivot tool and this, which looks like tic-tac-toe. Um, this is pretty convenient because basically I, I can snap. Let me just redraw that. Netbug says it might be easier to remember UVs as X and Y grid. Yes, but when you're starting out and you're hearing U and V and X and Y, yes, it's, your head will explode. Mine yes, did. So, so X, Y, Z is still something you're teaching to beginners. Yeah, like literally at first it took me a while to know like what the hell is X, what the hell is Y. I had to like make a bunch of like Sesame Street ways of remembering <laughs> or else I would never remember. Yeah. Uh, so v being vertical is one of our Sesame Street techniques. Yes. Yeah. So what we have here are these tic-tac-toe things. Uh, basically, it just moves my pivot around, right? So if I go select this one right here, it's going to snap um, to the pivot that it's the furthest um, to the left and the furthest down. If I do this, uh, again, it'll be that way here, and this will be my center. So I just snap it like this, and I just hold X, snap it to grid, and that's it, right? Um, it can be really, really fast if you if you know these tools, okay? Uh, once I had this, I basically exported my whole thing. So it looks like uh, mine is what I just duplicated here. Um, it's just stacked up tall. Um, and again, I have my square texture, which is easier and universally to work on in any program. So what I did here is I brought this in. Let's look at my low one. So it looks like this, right? And I just divided it many times. Uh, I'm not going to divide it as high as I did because it's going to take too long. Um, I'm just going to keep it at 6 million. But I did do one more, which is makes it really slow. And then I just import my texture. Give me a second. OK, so I bring in my displacement. And again, you have to remember to flip this upside down. So I hit flip V. And then I press make alpha. And what you have to do is you have to have a texture assigned. So normally, there's nothing here. Uh, you just have to press on, and it'll, you'll get something. And then you can go under displacement, and you can load this rope texture here. And we can see it. OK, so there's some seam stuff here. But again, it's cut in the inside. Um, that's why I tried to hide all that. And I can adjust my strength. Now, um, you can see it's not breaking the silhouette, right? Uh, if you want to actually see how far it's going to displace, you have to turn on mode. Uh, but mode will actually slow it down. But I can adjust this. And I can slide it to what I want. And I just hit apply, which I won't hit because it will take a while to process. OK, so that's how I got this rope. Now. The UVs are still the same. I still have my textures, and I just put that texture on, and it's going to be high res. So th that was that step. OK, so a couple other things here that I think is interesting. And this kind of bleeds into um, the technique that I did last week. Uh, but I did feel like when I did it, that someone looking at it would go, why did you do all that? Um, I think this one will kind of demonstrate why I did all this stuff last week. And this is for the sphere that's going to be broken. So let me just load that Z tool. Give it a second. OK. Let's find it. OK, here it is. So let me show you my sphere. Um, so this is a section of it. It's not the top part, right? This is basically the staff. So this is when it was whole. Uh, again, it doesn't have the the rope and all the other stuff, but this is the, basically um, the main body before it gets broken. Uh, and then I thought, 
you know, this is going to take a while. I already know this will be time consuming if I try to do it from scratch. So I picked a, I think it's stuck. Hold up. Yeah, it's about to crash. Maybe I should just force it. Um, I have a lot of things open. Plus I'm streaming. That's okay. Let me just kill this. Uh, did it come back? Nope. Okay. Um, when I have a lot of things open, this happens. It just moves. Yeah, but it's, it's not really wanting to, <laughs> it's having massive delays. Let me just kill that. And let me just try again. Okay. Okay, seems okay now. All right, here we are. Let's hide this other stuff. Okay, so I picked out um, Omega Scans branch that I thought had good broken ends, right? Um, now, this is a scan. It's super detailed, 17 million. You can see it has... Uh, a lot of the fine wood grain here, okay, which would normally be a normal map. So I don't have to worry about keeping the normal map because I have the high mesh. I'm going to import the albedo that comes with this. Just one second. Which I think is this one. Nope, that's not that one. Um, I don't know always because the mega scan names are complicated. Okay, but this should be it. Again, I'm going to flip the vertical. And I'm going to load that texture map on. Okay, so you can see that this fits it. Now, I want to preserve all this and I want to attach it to my staff, right? So the first thing I'm going to do in order, um, once I start bashing around, all the textures, all the UVs are going to break. So if I keep it as a texture format, it's gonna get lost. Um, so what I'm gonna do is convert it to polypaint. So I'm gonna to go to polypaint from texture, click on that, um, turn on this mode up here, polypaint from that, and now it's just polypaint. So if I don't have my texture map on, uh, I should have polypaint. Give me one second. What we're celebrating with the balloons uh so you probably jumped in a little late but it's it was trans birthday this week so we're celebrating her birthday all week long <laughs> yes okay so now this is polypaint i don't know why it didn't happen the first time um celebrating well we celebrate i get presents miguel's the best but we still worked <laughs> okay we still have to work okay yeah that's celebrating that's celebrating um, getting gifts and, and stuff like that, but we still have to work through it. So now I have this and all this is intact. Now, um, it's very important that this is super high res because uh, the resolution now is based on the density of my mesh. Okay, and then this is 17 million. And so all my color look, detail looks sharp because my poly count is high. I'm gonna grab my sphere here and I'm gonna duplicate it. And I wanna merge it with, with this piece down here. Okay, so basically I want to keep this end, right? So uh, let's just hide what I don't need. Um, also, let's just duplicate this in case I, I screw up because that can totally happen. It's a, it's a heavy sp uh, piece of uh, sphere. Um, thank you for the birthday wishes. So I appreciate that. So I have that hidden. Now here, let's turn this on. Let's say I want to position it um, somewhere in the center. And I'm going to get rid of this N. Um, it's not really getting rid of it. I'm just hiding it. But I do have overlap, right? Once I have this overlap, um, I can move this around. Just try to position it a little bit better. 
but I can also clean up some of the stuff. Um, I can also scale this down just a little bit. Uh, you know, let's just keep it larger. I'll fix it after I transfer it, all this stuff. All right, so now I have something like this. But right now they're two separate objects, right? Um, I'm going to come in here. I have to get rid of the stuff I have hidden. So I have geometry hidden. It uh, doesn't mean that it's <coughs> like, to do that when delete my subdivisions. Once I delete my subdivisions, I can go into modify topology and delete hidden. Okay, so now I actually don't have the part I have hidden anymore. I'm going to do the same here. Um, this one doesn't have, uh, it actually does have subdivisions. Let's just delete lower, delete hidden. Okay, so now I have these two. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge them together. Um, and I'm going to merge visible only. So I only have two tools visible. And let's go to merge. I don't have UVs that I need to preserve. It's just ply paint. So I can turn, keep it off. And let's just click merge down. Say OK. OK, so now it's all one subtool. So now I have uh, one subtool that has th these two ends, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this. And I want to combine it as one mesh. You can see that they're not combined. They're just um, chopped off ends. Let's just turn on double-sided so I can see this a little bit better. Um, but once I have this, and again, I duplicated that, I'm going to now uh, Z-remesh it. So I'll just choose a poly count. Let's just do 10, right? Which should bring around 10K. And let's just hit Z-remesh. Or sorry, I'm doing this wrong. Let's Dynamesh it. Dynamesh will actually merge it together. Um, I did have to bump up the resolution pretty high to like 4K. So let's just click on this. Okay. So you can see now this is Dynamesh. Again, here is my original one where it shouldn't be combined. And here's this one. Now the objects are merged. I'm going to duplicate this. And now I'm going to zero mesh it. So let's do this at 10. Now, I don't take zero mesh and ever use it directly. Um, that's because sometimes it has holes in it and it can have non-manifold geometry. Uh, and, and so I take it, I usually will export this and bring this into Maya and run a cleanup, right? Um, it's pretty simple to run a cleanup. You can just go to mesh, cleanup, and then you can open your options, right? Uh, but generally, you re I will regret it if I don't clean it because I can find later that there's a hole in it. Now, I'm just going to leave it like this. I'm going to ignore my Dynamesh one. And again, I have my merged object here, like this. And then all I do, once I clean this up, um, I might as well put UVs on it, is I just start dividing it. So it gets cleaned in Maya, right? And then it gets UV. And then it gets brought back in. And as I divide it, I have these two on only. So you can see that just the, my original one and this one. And I just project the details. So I just go to project all. Uh, yes, I want my poly paint data. And you can see now it's projecting the poly paint data. Now it also looks very low because my resolution is low. So I have to bring this pretty high, right? Um, I won't bring it to the highest. I think it's okay, 3 million. Or maybe that's too slow for streaming. Let's see how it looks here. Uh, but again, I bring it really, really high because I need to have my color data. Yeah, I won't, might not do the last one, um, but it probably is, is brought up around 16 million again. Um, each time you project, as you project higher, it's going to get slower and slower. Okay, so you can see here at almost 1 million, it looks pretty decent. Um, I'm going to stop here because we'll probably just spend the rest of the time looking at it, uh, watching ZBrush work. But now I have this, right? I now have a, a new piece of geometry, right? That's merged. And um, it has the color data. 
And then once I have this, and again, this would be divided super high, I'll just come back in here on the low level and kind of clean it up so that I don't have any of my seams. Um, and this is not a good cleanup job, but it's something basically like this. Just, you know, do it good and don't do it bad. Okay, once I have this and it has UVs, all this um, can be exported. So it doesn't, I don't have the actual textures yet, uh, but all I have to do is go to multi-map exporter, turn on texture from polypaint, set my resolution 4K, and just create all maps. And now this will actually turn into albedo data. And then I just take it into a texturing program um, just to try to clean this up, right? So let me load some stuff. Give me a second. Um, it's not difficult to merge. It's just a paint job. But I think this is a good technique if you ever want to steal um, data from a scan, which there's now a lot of scans, especially if you use mega scans, and you just want to merge it with something else. Um, because if I do this from scratch, I know it's going to take me quite a bit of time to get it to look good. Um, I just want to show you this file. Give me one second. So that's it for the sphere and how I did broken. And I want to show how I clean up the drum. Again, a lot of times when I'm doing this stuff, it doesn't look, I don't feel like it's super exciting. But this is, if you don't know it, um, it's pretty important. I think anybody knows by now that CG is not very exciting. No. <laughs> the, end, the end result is cool, but the process is uh, yes. watching paint peel. Yes. Uh, you're, you'll be interested in it when you're actually trying to figure out how to do this stuff and you realize if you don't have a, a good workflow, it's super painful. Or if you don't have the knowledge to do it, it's like impossible. Okay, so here's the drum initially, right? You can see it's Japanese and it has like Japanese font. Uh, it's pretty easy to clean out. Um, I wanna clone it. Now, let me just get rid of, well, let's make a new layer. So I'm gonna click on paintable layer, which is this icon, okay? I can just call this clone demo. And then here, um, we have a clone tool, Sorry. which uh, looks like the Photoshop icon. Now, if you just click on this and you go, you know what, I just want to clone, um, nothing happens. <laughs> so there's a, there's a, like a, it's not as intuitive. Uh, so there's a couple of things. One, in order to actually clone, you have to create a paintable layer and you have to go into your mode here. Um, again, this is like Photoshop and you have to set everything to pass through, okay? So you can see now my clone's actually showing up. So let's go to my history and just kind of backtrack here. Um, let's set all this to pass through, my height to pass through, roughness, pass through, basically every single channel. So I'm swapping my channels here which you probably can't see it. Um, but basically all my passes up here, okay? And everything is being set to pass through. Okay, now once everything is passed through, I can go to my clone tool. Um, what you also wanna make sure is to actually turn on every channel. So if I only have, uh, let's say roughness on, and I try to sample clone, area, all it's doing is uh, cloning my roughness. So you can see here, I'm doing changes here, um, but I have no changes in my base color, right? So let's undo those strokes. Alex is asking, um, in order to UV that tree trunk you had before, would you do it manually or using UV Master? I would never use UV Master. What is UV Master? UV Master is the ZBrush one. Oh, I see, yeah. So, um, UV Master, is cool and it does a really good job, but it's really inefficient in terms of how it lays out your UVs. And you really want to have resolution um, and some level of control of laying it out. Um, manual, it's not even that manual anymore, especially when you saw me show you um, this UV editor and all these buttons, right? Like I basically can press a button for almost anything. 
So back in the old days, we didn't have that. Everything was, was super, super manual for real, right? Um, now, if I have something, I can just click and this is going to make it straight. Click that, it's going to make it straight. Yeah, just, just when, we, when we were starting this, I remember our teacher at the time, Kevin Hudson, with my teacher. He, he was my teacher too. Oh, he was, cool. Yeah. So he told us like uh, the UVing process takes the same amount of time as the modeling process. So if a model took a month to do, you would spend about a month to UV it. Just keep that in perspective compared to what UVing is like now. Yes, it's UVing now is, is super easy. The but concept is hard to grasp, but once you grasp it, it's actually very simple. Yes, the concept is tricky to grasp, meaning how do you flatten something out, right? Um, the way I describe it is you picture it, you know, as a paper or a box or whatever, cardboard that you're trying to cut in a way that it's not going to crumble. So if you have a box that you're trying to unwrap, how do you, where do you cut on the box so that you can lay it perfectly flat? Um, and that's the trickiest part. Uh, the other thing that's difficult is if you're not taught how to UV, and you don't know the workflow, you're just staring at this and it just looks like a crazy menu uh, and you don't have a process. So if you're taught how to do that, then you'll, you'll find it's super fast. Um, if you're alone and you're just trying to figure it out by yourself, it can be really hard. Uh, but once you know it, it's not hard. Okay. So, so I'm gonna say that now we have Rhizome. I've never, I've, I've never used Rhizome. I haven't used um, is it Rhizom or Rhizome. I heard it's pretty good. But it hasn't really taken over Maya's UVs because um, I'll complain about stuff in Maya. Maya is pretty good at UV. You know what the problem is with tools like Rhizome? I remember there was a, there was a French company that was doing this amazing UV program uh, back in the days. I forgot what they were called, but uh, I remember it was expensive. And uh, I became super dependent on this tool whenever I was doing stuff at home. And then I remember I got a job at one of the, these companies and I was like, oh, by the way, I need to get this program. And they're like, we're not getting you that program. It's super expensive. Um, if you're relying on too many plugins, you'll be surprised how hard it is to sometimes get these things implemented at a company. Yeah, like had us back in the days. Um, but uh, I always was afraid of that because I'd, you'd go to another company and they'd be like, no, we're not going to put that in there. Yes. And then you're like, uh, I don't know how to UV in Maya anymore. Yeah. So. Um, it pro I heard Rhizome is really good. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's just, will that company actually have it? It's not, I don't think it's like a universal standard, right? So Substance Painter is a universal standard, any company. Um, so is Mari, particularly for film. You're, most film companies will absolutely have Mari. ZBrush is a universal standard. Everyone is using that. I don't think Rhizome or, or Rhizom is like that, even if it's very good. So um, then there's hesitation to learn it because you have to invest time. And then if you work somewhere, it doesn't have it, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I don't want to debate on that. I'm not saying that it's not good. I'm just saying it's not universal enough yet where you should just learn that um, until if it becomes- you can use it, that's cool. Yeah, if you can use it, that's totally fine. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. All right, let's jump back here on this. Um, and let's turn on all my channels and I can turn them on here just by clicking on them, right? So I have my color, height, rough, metal, normal. Once we have this, and I want to now clone it, I just have to hit V. So if I tap V, I can now, or at least I should be able to clone. Uh, looks like I have my pass-throughs gone just by undoing too far. So let's do that again. They all went back to normal mode. Okay. And now I can sample a section and just clean this up. Um, and it's not so tricky, right? You just got to do a decent job, which I'm not doing right now at the moment. But once I do this, I just clone in all these parts here. And the same thing with the side. Uh, but this is a very good way to modify. Um, as far as 
you know, I use other texturing programs, like I use Mari a lot. Uh, but when it comes to cleaning up scans, I think Substance is really easy to use. And it can clone multiple channels. Um, whereas Mari is not very friendly with multi-channel workflow. So it's very I'm easy to use as long as you don't have a lot of tiles. The minute you have a lot of tiles. Yes, the minute we have a lot of tiles, it has to go into Mari. Uh, meaning a lot of UDIMs. And you can see that this is still pretty light. So this is the workflow that I used here. Again, just putting a little bit more time to actually make this look nicer. Um, you can sample, you can just use the brushes here. So if I change a brush to say something like dirt, right, I can sample this area. And now I can kind of mimic what the original one was doing, just like that. So you can see that's working much better, right? And I can sample all this stuff here. Now, the one thing that was problematic um, was actually cloning my normal. So I can erase this just by selecting the eraser tool, making sure it's only set to normal. So it will only erase the normals here, right? And then it will leave my other stuff intact. And then when I go back to clone, just make sure to turn off my normal. Um, but you have tools for everything, and it does a really amazing job. Okay, so I think that's basically it here. Um, maybe one more thing. Again, they seem like really elementary stuff, but it is stuff uh, that I use to actually make this, what I um, did this week, uh, is how to model a, a ribbon, right? So if you look at my sphere, I have this here, and yes, I could probably do this in ZBrush, but I can do it very fast and fine in Maya. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set my subdivisions to 10, and I wanna just create a spiral, right? Which is not hard to do if you know how to do it. Let's uh, erase my caps. And I'm gonna go over to this tool, which is called multi-cut, go to my options, and I have my set, my snap set to 10. So this is set to 10, and what I also have is 10 subdivisions around here. So it's gonna work out mathematically. So I'm just gonna snap, start from this very top, hold shift, and then you can see the first point is 90%. Um, hold shift again, and it's 80, 70, 60. So I'm getting really even distribution, um, which, you know, you want to break this up later. Okay. And let's just snap this to the bottom. Or did I miss my math? I think I screwed up. Let's do that again. Sixty. Yeah, I missed the... I missed the point. 10, okay. Um, what's important is where I start here and end here, you can see they have to meet again. Now, once I have this, I just set my pivot, duplicate this, snap this down, and then I'm gonna merge this, and I'm gonna merge the vertices and delete this loop here. And I just do that again. And I'll just merge this, also combine this. Um, each time I do it, it's gonna get faster, right? So we'll just do it one more time. Snap this up, duplicate, snap this down here, then merge this. and then drop that loop here. Now I have a spiral. Um, a spiral. Um, so it is a spiral in the sense that if I try to cut a loop, you can see it goes all the way down, right? So I just prefer doing it like this. Um, I think it's faster to UV. Um, ultimately, if I decide, I'm gonna get rid of some of these ends, how I'm gonna work. Um, if I think 
I can UV this faster by just doing it in Maya. I'm probably going to do it in Maya. Okay, so now that I have this, you can see they're still merge. I'm going to split an edge loop, and that's going to be my gap. Then I'm going to select my edge, go to face path, delete that, and now I have like a ribbon, right? Um, I can extrude this to something like that. And I can flip my normals. And now I have this ribbon. Now I can take this into ZBrush and move it around, but I can also do some stuff in here. Um, for me, it just comes down to what I think is faster. So if I just go to Sculpting tab, we have these grab tools like this, and I can just move it around. Uh, and do a nice job. This is not really a nice job, but essentially like just like that. So it's actually pretty fast, right? And then it, again, I can just take this into ZBrush to sculpt on it further. Um, but I have a good start, and it will be very easy to completely UV. OK, so that's what I have. Um, I'm going to pass it to you, Miguel. OK, give me two seconds. Uh, see if anybody has any questions, and I'll take over. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, all right, so is there a way to repeat the last action, Maya? There is with G, but um, certain things work well with that and others yeah. don't. But if you hit the G button, um, like if I go edge here and I go um, edge loop and delete, right? Uh, that runs that command. I can hit G again. And that will repeat that command. Um, I use it a lot when I'm moving just because it's probably something I want to repeat. Yeah. So. Cool. So, all right. So let me um, do some stuff here. So this week... Uh, one of the things that we had to do is we, we seemed like we thought we were done with the rig and everything on this. And when we were looking at, at it much closer, we started realizing that the eyeball rotation, you're kind of doing the face recording on mocap X kind of in a vacuum. We weren't comparing it one-to-one -one with the footage that we were, um, re recording just the text data that it was spitting out. And when we started analyzing some of the share, stuff on, on the eyes. Want to share your screen? Oh, yeah, totally. Let me pull this up. Okay. Uh, I thought I was. So uh, when we were looking at some of the, um, the actual mocap, clearly we were seeing that the lids and the eye, uh, the, or where the eyes were looking, were not lining up perfectly. So I kind of panicked because I thought this rig was much was done at this point and we were back to like sending it back to uh first of all we didn't know if the problem was was mocap x uh not recording the eye position correctly or the eyelids not being recorded correctly or being tracked correctly so i kind of freaked out i'm like oh my god is mocap x not going to work uh so we trying to figure out where that problem was happening and literally started ending up like rigging like a sphere with two other spheres for the eyes. And I noticed that the eye tracking was perfect. So mocap X was doing a great job reading everything. It wasn't that. So something was happening on our end. So one of the things that mocap X wants to do is it wants you to create these locators that are centered on the eye. And these guys are going to be what uh, what rotates the eye. And then you basically just have a connection editor, very simple connection editor connection where you have like uh, what is being read as the eye translation. Uh, so let's say this is like the right eye. And then you would just come over here, go to that uh, locator, and you would just go to your rotate and link it X to X, Y to Y, and Z to Z. 
So pretty simple, but it wasn't uh, doing uh, the right thing. So we, we had to figure that out. But anyway, we got that working. So the, uh, the rig and everything looks great now. So I'm hoping that we're done with, with the rigs on these guys. So, uh, yeah, but like, I think yesterday I, there was a moment where I thought like, oh my God, we're doomed. We're never going to get this thing done. <laughs> Uh, if we have to send this back to rigging and everything. So, but anyway, that's figured that out. Um, Steven, I figured out where the problem was happening and then Steven figured out how to solve it. We're trying to get Steven on the podcast eventually, but just so you know, uh, mocap acts does work fantastic. So that's great. The other problem we started noticing, you're not going to see it here very much, but, uh, this is a weird thing where, whereas if I come over here and I go to my project settings and I have this set to direct X 12 my computer performs much faster. However, when I have that set, and this might be something that someone knows the answer to, but we, we still don't know it yet. When I have this set to direct X 12, machine much goes much faster, but I start getting this really nasty uh, shadows cast everywhere, which we have to figure out what is going on with that. So um, the stuff I'm going to show you now is not starting to put together like a rough edit of one of the beginning sequences just to kind of see what everything looks like. But at this point, um, let me see here. There is no, um, the lighting is completely throwaway. The, these sets are going to be completely set dressed, reset dressed again. And there's no real animation. It's just the raw motion capture. Uh, it's basically previous. It's basically previous, yeah. yeah. But we can start getting an idea of the sequence. So this is right after there was like a hunting uh, sequence that happens. And uh, our girl Koa loses her spear. So you're going to see the spears represented here with like a broken cylinder, but that would be the spear that Tran showed earlier. So Ah, Yamani. Nitakuwa nimeurusha kwa nguvu sana. Siuoni kweli. So that's a little section that we got uh, done. Uh, so this last one is just play blast right out of Maya because we don't have I didn't we didn't have the rig for the dad done in time to even put them in Unreal. But you can see this is the first moment where she finds uh, the cave, the hollow, um, and she's kind of being seduced by its evil. The sound, everything is is basically temp at this point, but. Um, yeah, you can start getting a feel of uh, of what it is that uh, that we're going for. So let me see what we have here. Ricardo had a good question. Um, how often do you get these showstoppers? All the Pro time. Problems, yeah. It's nonstop, Ricardo. It's like never-ending stuff. Like, like one of the showstopper ones is like what I'm saying with the shadows. Like this set looks really good before we update it to the new version of Unreal. And now everything is basically broken in it. Hence why I'm like showing it in black and white kind of. 
Uh, like if you look at some of these shots here, there's black spots all over the place. You can see like all this black here. Like, I don't know what that is. Uh, it's definitely something to do with nanite and how it's reading nanite because um, if I disable nanite, all of this is gone. So it's very weird. And it's unfortunate because the machine works so much faster in DirectX 12. You can see here as well, there's all this weird stuff everywhere. I mean, even like it's, this back it's here. It's connected like, to DirectX 12, right? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I know that when I turn that on, it, it's, it is, but I don't know if that's a problem of DirectX. I mean, it is connected, yeah. But, it's but I don't know if it's because DirectX or because of something in some silly setting that you have to like refresh in Unreal. But you can see like all these black spots here. Again, not that this terrain is done by any means, but this is. It still sucks to look at it. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Because so, you're like, oh, that oh that looks weird, and then yeah, everything looks crappy. Like because half of your screen has like black dots, black splotches everywhere. Yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, but but uh, this was cool to kind of see it for the first time and be like, okay, this is kind of like the tone we're going for it has a little bit of a of a fucked up horror vibe to it at the end when you know this is something that i wanted i've always wanted i might have to slow this down a little bit but i wanted the reflection of this tree to almost not the reflection the shadows of the tree to almost feel like hands and you could see that when she's seeing this the direction of the light is basically like the hands calling her to come forward, right? Like, come to me, kind of. Uh, and that's just by moving the main light. You might not notice it the first time, but that's some, something that I've always wanted. Um, uh, the 3090 and the 20, what do I have? I have the slower one. I have the 3080. You have the 3080. I have 3090. You have the 3090. I don't have the 30. I have the 20 something. Oh, you do? Yeah. Um, I still have the black spots on on mine, so. Oh, you do have it. Yeah, I have the same thing. Okay. Um, I when I, that, I only have it when I have Direct X twelve on. Yeah. I don't have it when I have it on eleven. Um, it does seem faster if you have Direct X twelve. From what I read, there's supposed to be hardware support for yeah. Lumen on Direct X twelve, which I don't really know. For Nanite. Yeah, for Nanite, I don't really yeah. understand the science or anything behind that. But it yeah. it is faster, but you have black dots. Um, did yeah, so I try to, to figure that out? Did we try to fix it? Yes, <laughs> but we haven't found a solution. Haven't tried to fix it long enough. Um, but we have Googled it, and there's not a clear answer for why we are getting black spots. Uh, we try to upgrade our graphics things and drivers, but that has not fixed that problem either. Yeah. So like, for example, like on a shot like this, like the father, I don't even have, uh, like I said, I, I don't even have them in Unreal at the moment. But um, I mean, I, I guess I'll just show like the way I'm kind of, so there's a few things. The first thing is I'm just kind of figuring out like what angles I'm allowed to use and what angles I'm not allowed to use. And so kind of establishing my 180 rule and for the most part, I'm always shooting this uh, from the same 180. It changes a little bit once we come over here. But once we're here, basically, you set up your 180 rule. And your 180 rule means if you were to look at your set from above and picture a circle around your set, the camera could only be on half of that circle, right? So anywhere from within that 180. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do here. So you'll never see the camera from this other side of Koa. Uh, so you're always seeing her right ear. Uh, so let me see. Maybe it's an RVT issue not working. Yeah, I'm not sure. It only, it only happens on Nanite. It only happens on Nanite, yeah. yeah uh i don't know what the fix is so if you know what the fix is that would be great yeah <laughs> so. 
Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, that's, that's our first pass of this one section of the film. Um, there's still more moments that happen before and after, but it was cool to kind of see it again, all the sound is temp. Uh, one of the, the sites that we've been using a lot for, um, for the sound, for sound is, um, but usually I use, um, freesound.org. Let me pull that up. I really recommend this site for um, for getting free sounds, right? Obviously, the name is is what it is. Uh, it's great when it works, but th there's not a lot of uh, quality control because I think it's kind of like anybody could throw anything on there. But there's amazing stuff, and I'm always pulling sounds from here. So highly recommend uh, this one here. The other site that. I've been using lately, you have to pay for it though, is the motion array. So if you look for anything in here, like say we go to audio, you go to sound effects, they have a bunch of stuff. And some of these are really amazing because you can go to like, uh, let's say, I don't know, point of suspense, right? Preview. 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 So you can see it breaks this down into these little chunks. And what's really cool is some of these are made up of multiple layers, multiple sound layers. Um, and what's cool is it'll give you all the individual layers for you to mess with. So you don't just have to use this as is, like just raw like this. You can adjust it. And even though you see like one long waveform here, it is usually broken up into a bunch of separate wave files so let me show you if you look over here um so if i download let's say boom transitions right come over here uh so you have all the different formats so if we go to let's say mp3 it's all broken down for you so it's a single download but you can see everything is uh set up like this so let me just see, open this up here. It's pretty cool. So you can grab that mix and match it. At this point, when we're just doing like temp sound, it's, it's amazing. Uh, for example, push, slide, drag. These are great. These are just sounds of things being pushed, slid along, or being dragged along, right? So wooden objects on the ground. Right, I think I probably used a variation of that when I was trying to get get it to feel like she's pushing the spear into the bush, which is a shot that we're still debating whether we need to actually show her physically doing it if her action is not reading it clear enough. Right there, we might have to have a shot of it behind uh, the bush, most He's likely. But you can see the sound is just playing in there, which is great. Um, the music at the moment, we're just using one of the things we did on this project, which we had never done before, is start working with the composer much earlier. So we already did uh, an episode with Dan where we he came in and he showed this stuff. But usually what we'll do is we'll use like a temp track from another movie. And on this project, we wanted to try to avoid that and just kind of use his music from the beginning as a temp track. So I'll slice it up and mess with it and distort it to all hell, but I'm not getting stuck with someone else's music and then giving it to Dan and being like, hey, try to make it sound like another person's art. Do you know what I mean? I kind of hate that. So on this one, what we did is since we had a little bit of a head start was just kind of create these different themes for different parts of the, of the movie and then cut those around. Uh, he had no idea. He, he'd read the script, of course, but he didn't necessarily know what we're going to use. So if I double click on this, you can see that we have all these waves here. So I could pull certain parts around. Right. So here, for example, uh, when she hears the sound for the first time, something calling her. You hear like that breathing. Usually what I'll do is I'll just come here. 
at this point, I'm like, okay, that's got the breathing sound. I'll cut it right there. And I'll just kind of position it exactly where I want it to be, which at this point, obviously I already did that. So it doesn't matter. But then if I want this to start building up, let's say here, it starts getting much more ramped up. Right. If I don't have enough time for this, I could always cut this. It's not going to be perfect, but I could cut this and reposition it. Then drag this out some more. Or maybe cut it right there before it starts building up. And now I've like lengthened this thing a bit. It might be a little abrupt. Okay, so you can see there is like a pop there, but I'll just go to the um, apply default transitions. Because at this point, I don't care about a polish. I just want to make sure that it works and I'll just blend between the two. You can see it works pretty well. You can't really see the blend uh, as badly anymore. You can't hear it anymore. Um, let me see what it says here. Are you planning to have a score for this? Yes, this is all scored. Uh, and then he followed up with um, the reason ask is because it seems many people actually start from the score. And no, I don't know if that's accurate. I think most people start from the edit and then they'll they'll start with a temp track. There's actually an entire video about about this on uh, on Vox about Marvel movies in particular. How everyone uses temp tracks. So they'll just grab music from other movies and, and stick it in the edit. Uh, I think using a track that already exists is like a luxury. I don't think a lot of people do. But you yep. can see. You have another question. What is it? Uh, is a level of ear candy you limit your work to? What is it? Is there a level of ear candy you would limit your work to? And then follow up by. Like how many layers of sound? No, I don't think there's any there's any limit. Uh, I'm not gonna do the final sound design, but I always deliver a pretty um, thorough temp sound design. So I know exactly what I want and I do like, I think if I ever did anything else that has nothing to do with visuals and it went back to sound, I think I would love to do sound design. I really do enjoy it. But um, I don't have the time to do it. And I always flirt with the idea of like, oh, on this one, I would just want to do the sound design. And then I realize I don't have the time for it. But um, the amount of layers doesn't matter to me as long as it feels rich. And at this point, it feels far from rich. But you could see my, my whole point here is like not to get stuck with, um, with anything at this point. Like even though we have the sound that this composer wrote and it's amazing, just butchering the crap out of it to make it whatever I need it to be. So you can see again, uh, just stretching that out, how well it blends in by, by using that. You know, I'm sure if you're really anal about it and you, you really focus, you'll hear it's not perfect. But it's pretty damn good. Yeah, just get the shots done at this age. Exactly. So. Yeah, at this stage, it's just getting the story down, getting the previous. That's really critical. Yeah. Um, that's the most important part, not getting caught up in the black dots, which are super annoying. Exactly. Like <laughs> so. one of the things, and this is the thing in the script, I originally didn't have, I had her walking up to this and she just kind of sees the cave. She thinks it's pretty amazing looking and she's obviously in awe of it. And then the horn blows and that's the end of it. And then it's her father and she goes to see her father. Uh, as I was doing it, though, I kind of like the idea of this thing actually seducing her and seeing it in her face. Like, even though, again, this is like the only temp facial stuff I did is just roll the eyes back. I thought this is a moment that it's not in the script, but I like the idea that it's calling her, showing that in the character. So one of the things that I also had to deal with is because I made up the sequence in the edit of her like stepping her foot forward like this, we didn't mocap this, right? So I was like, shit, I need to get, I need to get a shot where it actually looks like she's taking a big step forward, 
which I didn't mocap. So I had to find a shot where there was some sort of a, of a foot lift like this and the other leg was stuck. And then using the animation layers, I'm able to just adjust that a little bit. So like if I were to open this shot up, let me just pull this open. So if I go to, let's go to my shots and come over here. So my Maya, so let me open this up. So you'll see how much faster this thing actually plays in here because I only had, I think like 20 frames of this. Let's give it one second. Uh, a great example of this is if you look at like the original Star Wars movie, uh, because all my comparisons have to do with Star Wars, is uh, when Luke gets knocked down by the Tusken Raiders and it's like lifting its, um, its, its weapon up in the air. There, if you actually look at it, they kind of like looped it around because they found that in the edit to work really well. And it's kind of just bouncing. It's going forward to back and then it's playing in reverse the other direction. Um, so you could see here in total, it's 292 to 210. So 18 frames, but when I play it here, it's much longer than 18 frames. So it's almost four seconds or three seconds, right? So what I ended up doing on shots like that is I brought everything as an Alembic cache at the moment. So if I go to uh, my sequences and I go to let me find my shot here. Here it is. Okay. So we have our Alembic here. So I would just right click on these guys and I know like at this point it's completely cached and I would go to the play rate and this is something that I'm like doing in Unreal at this point. I know it's sloppy and it's something that I'd have to then send it back to Maya because all this clothing has to be simmed eventually. But I would just come in here and just be like, you know what, uh, let's go to our properties. And then you can see we have the setting called play rate. And I set it to play basically at 30% speed or 0.3% speed. So now those few couple of frames, those 18 frames, you can see are actually from frame 559 to 619. So many more frames in our initial 19. And it gives me just the right amount of time for the edit. Now I'll bring this into Unreal. Sorry, not into Unreal. I'll bring this into Premiere. And one of the things I, I do a lot at this point is already kind of baked in. So it's not a big deal, but let's say even this. Uh, I want to be so non-committal at this point that if I brought this shot in and I feel like it's, it feels a little bit too slow or something, at this point, I'll literally come in here and I'll go to right click on it and I'll go to my speed duration. And you can see there's 55 frames in this right here. I'll just come in here and be like, you know what, play it at 80%, 68 frames. And I'll put it in the edit and I'll see how that feels, right? And I go, oh, that, that feels much better. Or maybe I decide that I wanted to go slower than that. So 50%, 110 frames. Put it in the edit. There's like a weird uh, kind of a figure, like inter interpolation of frames or something. Uh, so it doesn't look great. But again, I don't care. The only thing I care about at this point is, does that play well in the edit? And if I go, okay, I actually, I actually do like this speed a lot, I'll just come back to it in case I don't, didn't write it down. 110 frames, okay, great. So now back in here, I now know 
that I need to get this thing stretched out, which I'm not going to do it right now, but I need to stretch this thing out to 110 frames, right? And there's a few things I could do to do this. That I could use the time editor or whatever. The other thing that I'm doing here, and I've talked about this a bunch of times, but at this point, it's just kind of, that's all I'm, I'm working on at this moment. But you can see that I have a million animation layers here. So I can just come over here, select this foot piece here, and you can see it creates a red dot here letting me know, hey, this is already in this layer, which I should probably name. And I probably will name them once I move on from like this previous stage to like a final stage. And it doesn't mean I'm going to throw everything away once I go to the next stage. Uh, so I'll just probably go in and rename it. But uh, let me just do completely from scratch. So I just select this controller here and I'll say, you know what? I want to put this on this layer here. So I'll just double check, uh, add selected objects. So I could just come over here. And as this is going up, I could just say, you know what? I want to rotate this foot a little bit more this way. So this is all mocap, all raw mocap, but now I'm making changes to that motion capture. And I could say, for example, I want the foot to completely rotate that way. It doesn't look great, but just so you could get an, an idea. And you can see now we end up like here. I could literally rotate it all the way like that. And you can see it's starting over here i could set the original rotation to zero set a keyframe now you can see it's doing the rotation and it's doing that that's just on my one animation layer so it's not destructive to the original motion capture data which is here so if i come over here and i select like any one of these joints uh, you'll see that there's like, well, it's not showing here. Uh, let me come over here. That there is a uh, mocap data like on every single frame on these guys here. So uh, yeah, it's not showing here, but yeah, every single frame has mocap data. So this is what I've been doing for all of these shots. So for example, uh, let me open up another one here. This is, again, this is all temp, but this is what I'm doing at the moment. So um, I could do this one here. Well, let me just do this one. So this is when she rolls her eyes back. So I'll just go to my Maya scene. Let's open this. Let me see any questions in the meantime. Yeah, you have a, is, is using a real illusion or Mixamo for these smaller shots possible for you? Uh, yeah, totally. If, if, uh, if we, you know, if we didn't own a motion capture system, then, um, then totally, but we do own, we do own a mocap suit. So. But if we had to, if there was something that was good and, for example, Mixmo, we would have no problem using it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't, I, I would use whatever, uh, you know, even though we have a mocap suit, like in this, in this chase sequence, uh, and that, that answers um, this one as well. In the chase sequence, the actress that we have, I don't know how much she could like jump over things. We probably would want to get like a really athletic, not that she's not athletic, but like an Olympian type of athletic person to do those jumps so that they look really kick ass. Uh, that might be a pain in the ass and I wouldn't be opposed like for a jump, even looking at Mixamo or looking at something, even at this stage, even though we have a mocap suit. Yeah. Well, because then you'd have to, it would actually cost a lot to one, you have to hire an actress Two, you have to make sure they have the right set that they can actually perform their jumps on. Yeah. so that they don't get hurt and that's where um that can get really expensive so you can see here every single frame has a keyframe okay so um if you want to make any changes to it it becomes super problematic because if you came over here and you grabbed for example her head if you rotated it here like that on the exact next frame, it would jump right back. 
right? So it becomes a nightmare. Uh, if I turn all of these off, so these are all the, that one I need because that's actually the placement, okay? So you can see that she kind of doesn't look like she's necessarily looking at any one particular thing. She's like looking up, she's just like chilling, like, okay, uh, let's see how the trees are, the birds, right? So I'm like, crap, that does, I need her to be like completely stuck on this thing, right? This is like the, holy crap, what the hell is this? Right? So I want to keep all the, the natural mocap movement and the swaying that is happening there. So I'm like, okay, uh, let's see what these individual layers are doing here. Some of these might not even be things you notice. Okay, so here you could start seeing that there's just one keyframe placed here just to kind of direct her head a little bit more in that one area. And I'm, at this point, I'm like really breaking this down into multiple layers so that I could really have a lot of control. Um, that's her eye ro rolling up. Right, that was like I wanted for the for the temp edit. I just wanted like a, a subtle smile. That smile would happen absolutely in um, with the facial capture stuff we're gonna do. And then this last one, these last ones here are the ones that are basically controlling the head rotation. <laughs> that's a spooky shot. It's a spooky shot, and I was a yeah. little bit afraid of what it was gonna look like, and, and that's why I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do an artistic choice here. And I'm going to start making the defocus much, much stronger here to do two things, hide anything that could look stupid, not just in the, in the temp edit, but in the final one, but also make it feel like she's losing focus, right? She's losing uh, her, her mind. And this is definitely put together in the edit because this right here, and this part here were originally one single shot. And then I just started piecing them all together, cutting them up. And so you can see this was all one with this here. But I think it works much better where she's not completely gone yet, but something looks off. Then we cut to the hands calling her in, which is first the shadows. This is one, for example, that even now I feel like I may go in here and go to uh, speed duration and say, you know what? I kind of want this to be a little bit slower. I want people to notice the shadows of the tree calling her into the hole. Right, so I might slow that down. I, actually I think that's do. a good idea because it's too fast. It's too fast, so, but you can see, I'm gonna undo it just so that I, because right now my brain is not thinking, and if I stick to anything I do on the edit, it'll be a mess later. But I'm probably going to slow that down because I'm like, you know what? This needs to be slowed down so that people have time to register that the tree is, like, calling her in. It should be one of those things that if you don't notice, it's fine. But if you notice it, even on the second time you watch it, I think it'll be a little detail because that's why the tree was designed this way. It was literally just so that the shadows... Look like a, they look like claws. They look like claws asking her to step forward. So she takes them. And then I got to pull you out of there really quickly. And I was, I, I debated how to do this and I'm still kind of debating it. I'm like, do I do it by having the dad blow? The dad has to blow the horn. So the, the dad blowing the horn has to be the thing that cuts it. But I thought, should I do it with a shot of the father, which is a character we have not seen up to this point, which will jank, jank. It'll pull you, the audience, out of the moment just as much as it's going to pull her out of the moment. It's going to be as abrupt. So I kind of like that. That's why I wanted it to be a completely new character, this loud uh, blaring sound of the horn. Uh, you will be like, what the hell? And that's exactly what the character is feeling. So the next shot after this would be her recovering from this. Now, since this is something that I kind of put together in the edit, I don't have the motion capture of her just recovering from that, meaning 
her leg is already in the air. Like she needs to kind of pull herself back and kind of take a moment and then look over and realize, oh shit, it's, it's Baba, right? It's her dad. Uh, I don't have that. So that's something that I'll probably record Tran or myself doing today or tomorrow and then put it into the edit because I just don't have that. I have this right here. I could show you. Um, actually, I could probably just show it here because the way we're doing this is we're recording. Um, since we recorded this with mocap, it's thousands of frames long. So the idea would be, let me create a new camera. I, mean, I guess this is cool because it's showing the train of thought. So camera settings, I'll turn on my camera right away. So the next shot for me would be, you know, excuse the eyes rolling back like the exorcist, but it would be that, right? <laughs> she's, she's there. And then boom, she turns really quickly. So if I use this as it is right here, let's see it. Let's see what it does. So just to not trip everyone out, I'll probably turn off the textures so that the eyes don't look like they're completely screwed up. So I'll just come over here, and this is something I'm doing all the time. I'll just come over here, find my camera position. I know that the longer my focal length is, the more out of focus the background will be, which I want that. So I might go for 80 millimeter. 80 millimeter is going to give you a really beautiful out of focus backdrop. So we're still kind of like in a trance. So I kind of want it to be about her, not about the environment anymore. So I can't see that, but I know enough about optics to know that that's what would happen. And then I would, I would basically just want this right here. Boom. Right. So I know this is not going to work again, because we've just established this holy crap, I'm possessed by the evil of this hole of, of this tree. And now, why do we go to that? And now if I just come to this right here, and she just re re responds like this, it's not going to be enough, but let's see it. Okay, so I know that it's going to be basically frame 650. So at this point, I'll already start setting my timeline. So 652, it's got to be a super quick cut. Uh, originally, she calls her dad right away. You can see the mocap is not clean here, so it's really bonkers. Now, it might seem like, oh, my God, the mocap looks like crap. Uh, this is ridiculously simple to fix, most likely, with the animation layers. Uh, it would probably take me... A couple minutes because I'll just have to find the controller for this. I'll create one layer where I'll just correct the, the rotation and that's it. It'll be done. It'll be actually very simple to do. So I'm not worried about that, but I don't want her to be calling the dad right away because she needs time to recover. So that's going to be too much. Now I might look further into the shot and be like, you know what? Maybe I don't use that head rotation. Maybe I use this one. Right. So, all right, maybe it's not in the correct continuity of the performance, how it was captured, but it's fine. So I might say, you know what, I might do this. So let's go to 819. So I'll just come over here, 819. And it's not correct in terms of the continuity and the way it was shot. Shot, you know, I say that with uh, air quotes to 861 because this is all mocap, so 861, okay? So at this point, I could kick it back to Unreal if I want to, but I don't even care at this point. And one of the reasons why I really don't care about linking this necessarily with Unreal at the moment, the biggest thing, because one of the, the things I showed last time is how I do like to have them both working with Live Link. The reason why I don't care is because there's no contact with anything here. So if, if you zoom out, you can see she's like totally floating in the air or whatever. I don't care though, because you can't see that. So I don't, I don't care. Uh, if I, if, if I had a shot like this, where 
I do have more contact like these guys here. Oh, then I would be doing this all through live link. Uh, but right now I don't care. So let's take a look. So I'm going to move it, frame it more to this side over here, because that's kind of what we've established. And do that. OK, I'll set a keyframe just in case. And I'll probably push in a little bit here. Now I have to keep in mind that I'm doing an aspect ratio of two to one. OK, so you can see our aspect ratio is very long. And another thing you notice is we're, we're kind of, not that this is really relevant to what I'm talking about at the moment, but one thing you might notice, especially if I turn off this color mat here, is that we are rounding off the edges. So we do want this to have like an old film look. Usually I would never want this, but for some reason on this, because we're going to make this feel more like stop motion at the end, when we start deleting the keys and making it jerkier, uh, I want it to feel softer. I want it to have heavier grain. I want it to look crappier. I want it to not look perfect. So I want it to feel like it's shot on 16 millimeter. So I've been collecting like a bunch of 16 millimeter images that I liked so that the final color correction will probably uh, look more like that. But anyway, so my point is, considering I have this aspect ratio, when I frame this, I have to keep this into account to a certain degree. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Like if you look at this shot here, and I might be jumping around a little bit too much, but you could see here, if I turn off the bars here, Okay, pay attention to this black line here. And look how it appears at the bottom all of a sudden. Because I know that I have these ugly bars here, not ugly bars, but I have these crop bars here. Let me turn this up. I actually like that because it allows me to reframe the shot a little bit inside of Premiere. So if I go over here to my controls here, you can see that I've actually adjusted the position of the, of the image within the frame inside of Premiere. So in the beginning, it's like this. And then the image starts literally just translating up. Now, there's a camera movement happening in Unreal as well. But I'm also moving the image as a whole on Y, moving it up to kind of make sure, because if I don't do that, check out what would happen. So you can see in the beginning of the shot, I have the tree. But the most important thing is not necessarily the tree, but it's this hole that we're gonna start focusing on on the next shot, the voice in the hollow. This being, you know, this is our, our hole. This is where the voice is coming from, which will be uh, explained at the end of the, of the film. But, um, if I do not do this, this is what I would have. If I delete this key completely, you can see the shot here, the tree, the tree, the tree, the tree. There's no hole ever. But by putting that in there, we now have that. And what's cool is it kind of feels like it's all a continuous thing. Like that is part of the camera movement, but it's not. The camera's doing its thing and then I'm reframing it or I have this wiggle room inside of uh, Premiere to change that just a little bit. That's better. It, it definitely helps it. So, um, so yeah, thank you for that. So yeah, you can see, but that's, I'm actually, that's what I actually really like. So I, just because you use this aspect ratio, I guess is what I'm saying. I guess that was my, 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 uh, why I jumped to that, even though I know I have this aspect ratio, I'm, I don't feel like I'm stuck here. So I should, the, the wrong way of doing this is saying like, oh, you know what? I only need to render uh, 
this right here and this right here. But then I won't have that wiggle room in the edit to adjust it. So I, I actually like to render it slightly bigger so I can move it, move it around. If you actually look at some of these filmmaker behind the scenes, in particular, like David Fincher stuff are, are really awesome. When you look at his camera view while he's recording, he actually frames his image much smaller within the frame. Like you actually see this, like our, your film gate here. He frames it much smaller than what the camera is actually recording. That way he could kind of reframe it perfectly in the edit when you're not in the chaos of the moment uh, and just get it perfect, right? A much more controlled movement than a DP trying to track along. Um, so anyway, so I wanna see if this will work. I know it's not gonna work, but this is, this is just my pipeline. At this point, I'll just come in here, play blast. Uh, quality doesn't really matter to me. Save to file, that's fine. Uh, for now, just put this on my desktop, uh, which I never would do, but I'm just gonna do it here because when I'm being recorded, uh, my brain is at half capacity, so I know I'll never find it again. So there it is, right? Right, so now I could just come over here to Premiere. I'm not caring about quality at this point, like I said. Probably cut it right there. You still want to keep that jerkiness of the moment. So I would come in here, go to my desktop. There it is. Plug that into that. At this point, you can see the scale and everything is all screwed up. It doesn't matter. I'll just move this up here. Let's take a look at that. Probably feels like it should cut a little bit sooner. So just come over here, throw that in there. You guys are probably going to lose your, your freaking hearing from this. <laughs> And there you go. It actually works better than I thought. However, you can never judge the edit on just three shots playing together. Okay, so at this point, if I go, you know what, that, that looks pretty good. At this point, I'm like, I got to jump forward, sorry, back a little bit and see it from the moment where she starts getting the seduction or right from this thing or seduced by the evil of this thing. So that's the only way to know if it really works. I'll play it from here. This is slowed down too, by the way, half speed. What I actually, I think it works all right. I still want to redo it and make her look like she's lost her uh, her step a little bit. But I actually yeah, I agree with that. She has to fumble. She has to fumble a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I don't have that mocap, but I'm just showing you like my, my train of thought. And I might even put this in here for now and be like, I don't like this, but I know that this is ultimately... The, the next shot, right? Yeah, it's a uh, beat. You have to have that it's beat. It's a beat I have to have. I'll redo it, but I'll still put it in the shot, in the sequence, like the dad with the horn. Like, this is not the shot, right? But no. I now know <laughs> uh, I got to get that beat in there. I got to get this beat in here. So it's going to be evil, and then turn around much faster, right? So uh, sometimes it's, it's the difference between like a single frame. So I'd be like, I got to cut when the head is already moving, so that's fine. But I'll sometimes just experiment and be like, let me just get rid of that one extra frame. Push this out. So, and then the next shot would have to be her POV of the father and the, and the sister uh, together. 
right? And the whole idea. So I already have the sound ready to go here. Baba, Angalia. Which I might have to re record. I, I know I'm going to have to re record that because here she just seems like she's like, hey, dad, check this out. I think I need her to be like recovering still and like first, like call her dad and like, you know, dad, like terrible acting, but you can see it's, it's more like a coming. Well, she's too uppity. She's too uppity. Yeah. She it still has to uh, be in this trance a little bit. The emotion is very different. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's fine. Uh, that's fine to, I rather have it and then realize, oh crap, that doesn't work. I'll give you another example of that. It was over here. Uh, it's not going to be perfect. Oh, actually, I don't even have the images for this, but you can see here. So this is the chase sequence in the beginning where they kill this one animal. One of the girls loses her spear. The other one ends up killing the animal. Right, the animal dies. We had to re-record all of that. So originally they were just like, they're talking in Swahili. And I was like, wait a minute, we just had this. 30 second chase sequence and now they're just talking that doesn't work but i didn't get it for you know it's my flaw i should have i should have known but once i put it all in the edit it became so apparent like oh crap that doesn't work i need to fix that i need to go in and make sure that that energy uh changes and that's just that's just part of the process you know what i mean luckily um yeah no one does anything just perfect linear the, yeah no no one does anything perfect the first time but the great thing is make and this is why um you want to start getting this stuff in the edit right away so like you can see this is this is one where it's completely edited everything is is in here and nothing there's no images yet but i already know that uh this is the length of my sequence right of this where one of the girls gets killed and i played this before but i'll just play it again Baba na kutafuta. Lazima twende sasa hivi. Mkakaka kaibia unichome. Sasa hivi. Ninge taka kukuchoma, ninge kuchoma. Lazima twende. Mkuja tuwane kama utapenda. Charibu. Hata unge anguka kutoka kwenye mti, hunge gonga ardhi. Wewe si chui. Nyamaza! Well, the spears flying like this is a, a, a moment. Mama, toka! This is a moment where I know I'm going to have to go back in there when the spear is flying in the air. She throws the spear. She's being taunted. She throws the spear, and the spear uh, does something it shouldn't do, which I think is pretty clear what it does. <laughs> uh, I know that once I put the images together, that part will be stretched out. That I know for sure. But I at least now know this sequence here, the whole thing is 37 seconds. Uh, no, no, sorry. This is uh, a minute and five seconds long. Probably with this last horn here, a minute, 10 seconds. So I'm cool with that. I'm like, okay, I could start gauging the length of this. And it's like, is this tight enough? A minute here. Uh, the beginning sequence that we have here. At this point, I'm working with frame numbers. But uh, so I'll just come over here and I'll change it from frames or to 24 frame per second time code. So this whole sequence that I have here, it says two minutes and 22 seconds, but you can see how much dead space I have in the beginning to account for the chase. So what we have right now is actually a minute and four seconds long. So that's all the stuff that we've seen here. So a minute and four seconds long, that's pretty good, right? And that's even past this part here. So I'm gonna assume this entire section is gonna be a minute, uh, 20 seconds, a minute, 15 seconds. And then the chase will be another, I think this is too long. It says a minute, it'll probably have to be cut down to like 30 seconds or something. So at this point, I still have this temp track of the chase, right? Which is a great song, but this part here, for example, might have to get cut down. And it might just have to start right here, which is 30 seconds in. You can see I already even have this in my uh, working space as 
kind of anticipate that's where the cut will be. Then the spear goes in the air, right around here. But yeah, that's how I'm putting this all together. This is the workflow. Uh, not getting stuck on anything, but at the same time, the minute I'm, I like anything, right? So the minute I go, okay, this works, it doesn't work. But if I feel like this works, this is what I would do right away. So this is my, you know, uh, lame ass pipeline. I just have my shots, the sequences. So this is under the chase kill. This is a kill the animal. Okay. So I have a bunch of these here just called blank shot zero, 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 right? If you open any one of these, there's a bunch of folders in there. There's shot notes. There's nothing in here at the moment. Okay. But if I have any notes, I'll put them in there. And then I have my cameras, my Maya files, whatever. So this shot, for example, uh, doesn't have anything. Right? It's not a shot yet. But let's just say I wanted to, to work with this. I would just go, okay, I want to say, I want to make this a shot. This would be, uh, I would just grab one of the blank ones. And I usually just try to have a few of these just hanging out here, just so that it's very simple. In case I go to file, save scene as in, I'm like, oh crap, I forgot. I don't, I don't even have that shot yet. Right? So I could just come over here. Um, and if I'm like, oh, crap, I forgot to do that, I could just come over here and rename it. And I'll call this, uh, like, Awaken, right? Whatever. I don't care about the names, but I need to make it so it's something that I know what it is. Okay, so that's what it is. Uh, Maya Cleanup. So I'll just call this Awaken. Clean. Save as. Right away. I know that this is eventually going to have to find its way into Unreal. View, select camera. So I have a push in here. Uh, I'll just go into my animation editors, my graph editor. And you can see there's an ease in, ease out. I don't want ease ins or ease out. I want linear movements for push ins always, as if they're being pushed in on a dolly. So I would set that to linear. I have my keyframes there. Uh, view select camera, which I already have, file, export, selection. Go back to my shot, awaken, cameras, awaken. There it is. So now I know that this is frame 819 to 861. Uh, I could just come in here. Shot notes, what I'll usually do, so I know there's only one file in there called a uh, text file called shot notes. I could just put shot notes here and then just so it's very easily uh, accessible to me, I'll just put 819 to 861 as part of the name so that if I ever am like in Unreal, I'm like, what is the frame length for the shot again? I could look at it there, and then if I double click on that or open it, I would have more details on that one shot. But I now know what it is I have to um, edit it down to. Uh, the mocap would go in here, um, which I already have it on another file, so I don't have to put it in there. But if I export or I do any cleanup to it, it's there. The renders, you can see I already have the folders for their temp. So this is all the stuff, for example, that you're seeing here. All of this is under temp because this is going to look a zillion times better than this. So I would just put that in temp. And then once I do my finals, I'll stick them in there so that everything is organized. Stupid stuff, file organization. But sometimes the things that keep you from not wanting to work on your projects is just having a mess of stuff and having it organized like this has helped me a lot. So anyway. That's how I'm putting together the edits. So next week, we'll have a lot more than this. Um, I hope you guys, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Sergi, that's exactly right. It's like mimicking. So Sergi said, uh, 
mimic you working on set, you shoot full frame and crop and post. That's exactly that's exactly it. I love it. Uh, I know that I'm supposed to be as a director, the, a genius that knows exactly what he wants from the very beginning. I'm clearly yeah, but not. that's a that's a misconception because yeah. yeah. then everything would be a lot cheaper. Yeah, I um. I, I, I love. <laughs> I love sitting in the edit. I, editing is my favorite part of the entire process of everything. Like I think editing is what I love the most. And uh, I love having these options in editing. So, um, so yeah, let me see. Is, is there any questions? Um, well, does anybody have any questions at all? No? Well, all right, if there's no questions, well, you guys will see some more uh, updates next uh, week. Let me see, I'll put this here. Um, so if you guys wanna follow some of our work, check us out here on um, Half Empty Studios on Instagram. It's Half Empty because we're pessimistic bastards and because it's <laughs> Half Miguel, Half Tran. Um, well, Miguel is not pessimistic, I am. I've become pessimistic. This industry has broken my heart, so. <laughs> uh yeah so uh but yeah this industry meaning the film industry more than the visual effects industry the visual effects industry has always shown love to us but the film industry has a uh, not... vicious bastard <laughs> yeah yeah so uh but yeah but so thank you guys so much uh for tuning in and uh i hope you guys enjoy like this is a lot of what the next couple of weeks is going to be at this point you know, the assets are getting wrapped up. It's just making things look much better and everything is going to look um, much better at the end. Thanks, then, Alex. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Alex. Your birthday's coming up too. Thank so, you, uh, Mr. Chicken Wings too. <laughs> Mr. Chicken Wings. So um, yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> and again, it's Tran's birthday this week. So everybody wish her a happy birthday. No, that's okay. Miguel's the one who likes to embarrass me for that, yeah. Yes, sir. Chatty on fire. How are you, sir? So yeah. Um, uh, what was the question? We have one question. Are you guys locked on cameras yet? We're not locked totally. Like there's a few, a few of them that I'm like, oh, I love this shot. Like I know I'm locked on this but I know that the vines don't hold up at the, none of this holds up. So, okay, we have to redo, we we'll probably have to redo the, the, this, all of these assets for this one shot, right? This camera, I know, I love this camera angle. So I know I'm stuck on that. There's some that I'm stuck on for sure. doesn't mean I'm not willing to change it. I know I love this shot. There's something that's kind of hypnotizing. Uh, this one I, I like, but I don't like this stuff in the foreground. We need to have trees in the foreground here. So we feel like we're entering a new section. Yeah, so that's that more that's more like layout. Set so. dressing. Yeah. This one might change a little bit. This one, Tran doesn't like it. So we might change <laughs> this camera. This camera I like. I know that uh it might not read clear that she's kicking this spear into the bush. So we probably need a shot there. Uh I like this shot here because we needed it to feel far so i kind of like this one so i'll probably stick with that one uh they're not locked but they are cl close they're close the thing that we found is uh i actually really like how she looks up close like when i look at these shots this is not the final material uh some of these even have the normals flipped just to show you how little i care about this at this stage but i, I kind of like the intensity and i'm like wow the fact that it's like a uh, emotionless doll it work it still works pretty well so some of these are i'm pretty stuck with i like this shot but it, but so yeah like maybe 50 percent are locked ish so but yeah um thank you uh, are we planning to do uh and thanks Ricardo. replacements yeah thank you and thanks Devin. oh yeah that's trend that's, that's so, yeah, I just want to say thank you because he yeah, yeah, totally. nice to me. <laughs> so. Uh, so Sergi's asking, are you planning to do work in post? You know what? I would I think my old my instrument is really like nuke. I would love to use nuke in this, but they don't use uh their the bridge from Unreal to Nuke is not working in five. The minute it works, uh 
I will 1 million percent try to do a lot of this in Nuke, 100%, a million percent. Anybody that's taken my classes at Nomen knows that I would, uh, you like I could nuke? drive my car in Nuke, I would do it. Uh, <laughs> like I would have nodes for everything. So I love it. So I would definitely try to use it if I can. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about color correction stuff later, but there is like a temporary color correction stuff being done at this point. This tool, uh, I love this tool, Film Convert Pro. Uh, I love this thing. So there's a bunch of like LUTs and different film stocks. And what's really cool about this, I'll show you this real quick. So right now you can see I have this set to like 35 millimeter. Let me find like a shot that I, that I like, like this here. You can see it's already kind of soft to begin with. But if I come over here and I set this to like 16 millimeter, it immediately makes the grain much thicker, not thicker, but bigger because you're zooming into a, a smaller image. And then it's, it actually defocuses the image. It softens it. If I then set this to like eight millimeter, you can see it actually makes the image look crappier and crappier and crappier. It's not just like, heavier grain. It actually blurs the image a bit. So I, I really like this. Uh, I don't know. I'd, I would probably, I want a super 16 millimeter look. That's like the one that looks the best to me. I love super 16. So I want it to look like this. I want the grain to be heavy. And while everyone is trying to make their images look sharper and stuff, I want ours to look uh, softer and more defocused and crappier crappier in a in a filmic way but this tool cannot uh hype it enough i love it even for preliminary color corrections you have your levels just like photoshop um so you could see if i turn this on or off it, it there's a, it does a lot super temp i haven't done it on a shop by shop basis right now everything is just getting the same thing but i love this tool i have it for uh for Premiere, and I have it in Nuke as well. So um, I love it, yeah. Oh, so you have the same tools? So Serge is saying he has a Film Convert Pro. Yeah, it's it's pretty kick-ass, so. Uh, all right, guys, so we're going over. Uh, yeah, Film Convert is the best. I Did I convert you, Dev, into this? Was it me that converted you? Because uh, I know I've been hyping it up forever. So, um, so, oh, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So yeah. it's a, it's a kick-ass tool. Uh, there's a bunch of cool uh, film presets here. So you can see you could change this around. It's just, sometimes it's just cool to see it with like a different, like I kind of like this. The blacks are a little bit redder. So I, I like it a lot. Um, yeah, so Devin says yes. So, yeah, um, I cheerlead these tools. So, all right, guys, so... Uh, I thought we weren't even going to have an hour worth of stuff and we've gone over 10 minutes. So thanks everybody. Thanks to Noman and Alex as like always for making this a possibility and uh, this would not happen. And happy birthday, Tran. And uh, yes, thank you for tuning in. Um, and I'm going to keep the balloons there until they, 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 <laughs> until they pop. Yes. Okay. And yeah, don't get uh, helium balloons at party city. They die really fast, not even 24 hours. So very, very upset. All right, guys. So thank you so much and have a great weekend. We're out of um, here. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.